Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of The Crude Report, which is our periodic podcast on developments in crude markets. My name is Jeff Kralowitz. I do business development in the Houston office for Argus, specifically on crude. And with me today is Gus Vasquez, who is our crude market coverage editor. He leads a team of, Gus, I believe it's six people now. Actually, we're up to eight. Ah, okay. Eight, eight people covering uh, Western Hemisphere crude markets. So let me just uh, introduce the topic. We're going to talk about WCS, the Western Canadian Select, which is a blend of crudes out of Western Canada that has become really the benchmark for, for heavy crude in the Western Hemisphere. And Argus introduced a couple of years ago a WCS at Houston, which is, uh, you know, looks at the trades of WCS at Houston. And that has become a very strong benchmark, really the first time in history that we've had a strong uh, hedgeable price for sour crude at the Gulf Coast. So we're going to talk about how strong this is. Gus has some data to share. We'll talk about the infrastructure developments in North America, how that's supporting the growth of this WCS Houston. And we'll talk about um, the production that we see continuing to grow in Western Canada. So, Gus, I guess over to you for a little bit of uh, intro to us about how strong is this benchmark. Yeah, so thanks, Jeff, for that introduction, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, as Jeff was mentioning, and if you're at the Gulf Coast, it's no surprise that uh, this WCS price at Houston has really taken off because there's always been uh, this need really for a kind of heavy sour benchmark in the region. And over the years, Maya kind of took on that mantle and it was used as a point of reference, uh, including uh, for Canadian crude back in the day um, to see where values were at the Gulf Coast. Uh, of course, Maya crude is a formula price uh, based crude, so it's not sold on an open spot market. So that's where this WCS price really kind of comes into its own because it's a spot market price at Houston, which is very much reflective of the reality that, you know, both buyers and sellers are seeing out there. And we've seen this price grow as time has gone by in in terms of volume, we just finished the latest trade month here at the Gulf Coast, and in Houston, there was just about 235, just over 235,000 barrels per day of spot trade reported to Argus on that WCS price at Houston. So that's that's quite a lot. Um, it's a little bit higher than we saw the previous month when it was about 210, uh, but it's it's been over 200 for a few months now. And just to put that into perspective as to how big that is, if you look at Mars, which is a very well-established market, has been around for a long time and it has been a medium sour benchmark for a very long time. For the the trade so far this year in 2022, the Mars average for monthly volume is about 290,000 barrels per day. So when you talk about WCS Houston at 235 or so, it's almost the same size as Mars. So that's, that's a very impressive number. Um, in terms of participants, same thing. We see a lot of participation here. It's a very open market. Uh, last month, for the trade month, we had 17 unique participants who were in that market. Keep in mind, though, that those participants can be both buyers and sellers, so they can be on both sides of the fence. So that also adds to the kind of liquidity that we see. And then, as Jeff was saying, with it becoming more of a benchmark, there is also a future swaps contract attached to this on ICE, and there is open interest on that. And for the previous month, the open interest was about 16,000 lots, and every lot is equivalent to a 1,000 barrels. So that's the equivalent of 16 million barrels of open interest on that contract, which, again, uh, it's not huge, but it's certainly healthy. And if you're looking to hedge your WCS Houston price, you can certainly do that. So that's a useful tool that we have there. In terms of how this price fits in the broader picture of the U.S. Gulf Coast, what we see is that it is tracking uh, other regional grades. So, for example, Maya and WCS Houston right now are very much correlated. When you look at their outright prices, they're completely in sync. Uh, this is this is an interesting development because that wasn't always the case with Maya because it was a pr it is a price 
that is a formula based price. Uh, it didn't always follow markets, but what actually happened there is that Mexico changed that formula to include WTI Houston and Ice Brent plus a monthly adjustment factor that they set up. And that formula that's now much simpler and is based on market trade is actually putting Maya right up there um, with WCS Houston. So it looks, even though it's a formula price, it very much looks like a like a market price. And then, you know, there's correlation with other Latin American grades. So we see that Vasconia and Castilla out of Colombia, there's some correlation there. Of course, there's going to be a bit of a spread because the qualities are different, right? Uh, Colombian crude is tends to be less sour, um, maybe a little bit lighter in terms of API, though they're still kind of medium sours. Uh, but they track each other fairly well. And now recently we launched uh, Ecuadorian assessments again for Oriente and Napo, and we see some correlation there too with WCS, as much as those grades can correlate to the Gulf Coast because they are, they do mainly go to the West Coast of the U.S., but there's certainly a correlation there. So you can see that you know, people are looking at that WCS Houston price to kind of determine where the value of their crude should be based on the quality differences. And that, I think, is one of the developments that leads to benchmarking, obviously. Awesome. Well, you know, Gus, one of the things I, while we're talking about pricing, one of the comments I'd insert there is to remind people that we do publish a WCS CFR Chinese coast. Uh, and it's interesting, I was looking at these numbers yesterday. Uh, if you look at the delivered price for WCS at the Chinese coast, it's about $8 under the delivered price of Basra. And so you do have these signals about whether, uh, you know, Western America, Western hemisphere crude is going to be pulled into the Chinese coast at advantageous prices relative to the Mideast Gulf. Yeah, I mean, I think numbers like that would indicate an open ARB. There's certainly an opportunity there. Um, and we have seen more WCS volume leaving the, the Gulf Coast, as well as more WCS volume coming into the Gulf Coast. Uh, and it all goes back to production and infrastructure. And I know, Jeff, you keep a close eye on all that. Yeah, that, that's a great segue, Gus, because, uh, you know, unlike some benchmarks in the world, and I won't <laughs> – you know, dated Brent has been a focus of attention the last several months where you have declining underlying uh, production supporting that benchmark. The uh, WCS is supported by growing production. In fact, uh, Alberta, the province of Western Canada where WCS is produced, um, had about a 5% jump in production just from January to February of this year. Its production recovered to pre-COVID levels faster than the U.S. Uh, Permian did. And it's now about 3.7 million barrels a day coming out of uh, Western Canada. And about 3.2 of that, or let's say 75% of it, is, uh, is these oil sand crudes, the type of heavy crudes that go into the blend for WCS um, that, that comes to the U.S. Uh, I guess, Gus, the other thing you were talking about, you know, the other grades of heavy sour in the Gulf Coast or in the Western Hemisphere that are influenced by WCS Houston, uh, w, the Canadian heavy is now the single biggest foreign contingent of crude that's run in the Gulf Coast. So in January, the latest month for which we have figures, there were 572,000 barrels a day of Canadian that was uh, imported into the Gulf Coast. And Mexico was nearly tied at 571. And then way below is Saudi crude at 250,000 barrels a day. And Colombia provides a little over 100,000 barrels a day. But Canada now routinely is the biggest supplier of foreign crude to the Gulf Coast. And that just makes this benchmark of WCS at Houston more relevant to the market. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, you have not just the increasing production, but 
those numbers that you're mentioning about, you know, Canadian crude coming down to the south, a lot of it has to do with the changes in infrastructure, right? So you have this uh, recent addition of 370,000 barrels per day of capacity on line three that came on last fall. And then since that, it, apportionment has really uh, fallen. And in fact, we had no, appro- no apportionment uh, on Enbridge for May. And I think that was the third month in a row now that we've had no apportionment. Um, and maybe here there's <laughs> we should we should add a, a little note for those who don't know uh, apportionment in Canada is a system whereby you tell the pipeline operators how much volume you have to move through their pipes and everybody does this and then the operators look at all the all the proposed volumes and see how much that is within their capacity and if it's above their capacity then they say okay you can only move 80 percent of what you wanted to move in the first place and they do this across the board for all the different uh participants that are trying to move crude on the line so when we say no apportionment which we mean that everybody that wanted to move volumes were able to move 100 percent of those volumes on the pipeline system yeah and i think gus one of the significance of that is just that with the reduction of bottlenecks between Western Canada and the Gulf Coast, everybody who wants to send crude to the Gulf Coast can. And that means we could be seeing a bit of a bidding war between the Pad 2 Chicago area refiners who already run way over a million barrels a day of Western Canadian heavy uh, between them and their counterparts on the Gulf Coast. And if if that kind of bidding competition for heavy Canadian develops between Pad 2 and Pad 3, you could expect all those refiners in both pads to start trading versus uh, WCS Houston, which is kind of the common pricing reference for for both of the the areas. Yeah, that that, that, that would be an interesting development. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And it would make total sense, as you say. I mean, if if you're going to be, uh, you know, uh, trying to outbid your counterparts, you're going to use a common benchmark for that. So, Gus, I want to squeeze in something about the current spreads between Hardesty and Houston. You guys watch that really closely. What's been going on with the the, uh, price spreads there? Well, so interestingly, um, despite all this volume that has been coming down that you've mentioned, that spread between uh, Hardesty and Houston has actually been uh, relatively narrow. Uh, we've seen it down to about six dollars twenty-five, um, and usually, you know, we the magic number uh, is about ten dollars to move crude from Hardesty down to Houston, and that's that's based on the pipeline tires, right? So that's your cost of transportation should be around ten bucks to get through the pipelines down to Houston. So usually, the spread, you know, would need to be ten plus uh, if you're going to make a profit. But right now, even though that that is narrow, the we see that the volumes have still continued to move. And um, obviously, uh, you know, the SPR release yeah. uh, has yeah. had some effect on, on that Houston pricing um, that for, you know, for, for people who maybe are, are not in the U.S. or following that. Um, we're talking about a commitment from the government to release a million barrels a day of uh, strategic petroleum reserve crude for a total of six months. So 180 million barrels uh, is, is the total amount. And that is obviously a lot of uh, additional supply that the market uh, wasn't expecting. So obviously that's, that has had an impact on the value of not just WCS, but crudes like Mars and Poseidon, as you see another sort of medium to heavy sours in the Gulf Coast, because that's what's mostly going to be released. Um, however, exports could alleviate some of that. So we don't expect that spread to remain narrow for very long because people are already making some moves. Uh, we have seen Mars being exported. We would imagine that WCS exports might also inc- increase because what people could ultimately do is take those SPR barrels to run in their refineries and sell crudes like Mars and WCS because they have well-established markets. Yeah, uh, some it, of the crudes that come out of the SPR, it would be really tricky to trade them because there's no established market for them. Yeah, and so it, it's easy to just substitute, and so you're going to see people trading away those Mars and WCS barrels instead. 
So, yeah, and one little data point on that is even before these SPR releases and even before the Ukraine situation, uh, in December of 2021, just a couple months ago, uh, we saw 266,000 barrels a day of heavy Canadian re-exports out of the Gulf Coast, mostly going to Asia, a lot going to India. And so the trend has been that way anyway, and this SPR release could just accentuate it. Um, I think we're going to try to squeeze in two more things. Uh, we're running short on time. One, the effect of the TMX construction in Western Canada. And secondly, the uh, announcement about the Lyondell refinery. So, Gus, I'll take the first one, and I'll leave you to, to tell us about Lyondell. Um, I think the significance of the Trans Mountain ex extension that's being uh, – or expansion that's being built – with a target uh, in-service date at the end of next year. One of the impacts of that, of course, the primary impact is it allows about 800,000 barrels a day of Western Canadian crude to go to Vancouver, load on Affirmaxes and go to California, go to uh, Eastern uh, Asia, wherever by water. But the other impact of TMX could be to further reduce any kind of apportionment or bottlenecks on the system and just make it easier for crude to get to the Gulf Coast. And all of that makes WCS at Houston more relevant. So, Gus, what's going on with Lyondell that would affect the uh, sour Canadian market? Yeah, so this this is very new. So Lyondell just recently announced a couple of days ago that unless they can find a buyer for the refinery, they are getting ready to close it down. But that won't be till the end of next year. So this is not something that's imminent. It's it's about 18 or so months away, uh, but it's something that could potentially happen. If no buyer uh, appears for that refinery, then you are obviously going to see uh, a little bit of demand uh, disappear from the Gulf Coast. And this is important for Canadian crude because Lyondell has been running about 87,000 barrels per day of Canadian crude. And this is, this is for the second half of last year. That was about the average. Um, and they were also kind of one of the biggest importers into the, the region for Canadian heavy, uh, taking about 40,000 barrels per day, uh, of that. So it, it could, you know, potentially leave a gap there, um, in terms of demand. However, uh, as Landell said, uh, you know, they are happy to uh, take bids on that refinery, and if they can find a buyer to take it over, then ultimately things might not change all that much for Canadian crude. Um, because the news is very recent, I don't, you know, I think uh, the impact hasn't really filtered through to the markets yet or anything like that. I mean, people are obviously talking about it, but it's very early days and it's very far away. Um, when you think about it, there are kind of potential um, buyers that you could see stepping in, um, you know, <laughs> company companies that would want to keep Canadian crude running at the Gulf Coast. Um, there's potentially companies that would want to have a refinery so they can then take the resulting products to, you know, foreign countries, et cetera. So, you know, if you look around in theory, there should be some interested buyers that that would want to take a long, hard look at that Lyondell refinery. But, you know, at this point, it's all speculation, and we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. Well, speculation is a great point to wrap this up. <laughs> we don't, don't want to do too much of that, I guess. Uh, but thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, on this edition of The Crude Report, and we'll be back very soon with another edition looking at developments in the, the world's crude markets. So for Gus and I, thank you for joining us.